Hey, it's me, Max. Welcome to Stitch of Fate, a Vampire the Masquerade V5 podcast. Since we'll be portraying vampires who have left their mortal lives behind, expect there are going to be bad things that deal with difficult themes and content meant for an adult audience. This content may include, but is not limited to, body horror, murder, gore, extreme emotional situations, and graphic images. Remember, don't hold those actions against the players, just the character. Take care of yourself, and uh, take a break if you need it. The Stitch of Fate, a Vampire the Masquerade 5th edition podcast. As always, I am your storyteller, Mike Martin, joined by my four wonderful players, Bub, Dot, Josh, and Mac. Uh, Mark. Damn it. Damn it. I was always, I had to happen eventually. I was going to mess one of you Memphis? up. You, you got a few episodes without doing it. Yeah, that's all right. Well, I called Josh, I uh, Sean, Josh all like like twice last episode. So it was just. Yeah, so did, uh, so did Max, names. I think. So. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's very true. <laughs> So we're all good. Yeah, he was I just changed my name on Zoom. He's just peering into another world. Yes. <laughs> and happy Halloween, everyone. I think this is our happy Halloween Halloween, Halloween it episode. Is our mm. Halloween episode. If you're listening to this on Friday. I am I am excited for this episode, obviously for reasons that we've discussed before, but also for reasons you none of you are aware of yet. Oh man. But we are opening on something that may give a peek into a little bit more as to what's going on. So, without further ado. Let's rein it in, and let's see what our coterie is up to after we set the scene. It is just pitch darkness, before it's perforated with a splash, as Sean's feet collide with the concrete ground and the sewer water sprays in all directions from the impact. A a head, maybe about a foot, there's the woman. The cat ear headphones still covering her ears, and she's facing you, expectantly, and waiting. There is only going back, or forward. There is no ladder out of this particular manhole. And she turns with a playful grin, as creepy and disturbing as it may look with stitches in their lips, and she begins to walk away from you. Sean catches up and tries to walk. Is there enough room to walk beside her? He asked if you'd like to. Yeah, he'll do that then. As you purposefully walk up next to her, and she realizes it, she saddles off to the side a little bit, giving you a little bit more room so that you're more centered and not half on like this lifted, curved ground and more on a flat one. And after she realizes you're joining her, she her eyes dart to you every so often, and she smiles warmly when they meet. Her hand ever so gently grazes yours, but never truly grabs for your hand or any uh, flirtation in that regard. But you are close enough where you can feel the cold hand of hers against yours for quite some time taking random turns and moving downward a lot of the time. There are plenty of areas where you're certain Nosferatu are here. You're not sure if every rat that passes you belongs to one, but that paranoid thought will always sit in the back of your mind. You know how they work, and you know they operate without being seen. But she walks confidently and continues down the sewers until eventually she finds a back room. Not the typical concrete slab of a back room with a 10 by 10. Instead, it seems to be more of an antechamber. You walk through this large metal door that she's it's unlocked and she drags out. And as you walk in, it's a large circular room that leads further, a larger tunnel. A vehicle could probably fit down here, actually. And it goes deep, the lights on the walls stretching across. But it's not enough to illuminate more than like 20 feet ahead of you before it dissipates into that darkness. And she continues to walk me. I get a wits awareness roll from you, Sean. You can. As the door the shuts do. behind you, or she shuts the door behind you. One. Okay. Nothing yet. She continues to walk. Does Sean uh, stay with her even now through through this? Or is Sean uh, seemingly more cautious at all? Or is he just like at this point like, fuck it? Uh, 
yeah yeah he's he's basically like fuck it there's okay. too much going on here for me to worry you will stroll down this large circular corridor for about an hour before you get another wits awareness roll you're probably Ooh. quarter away or like a, you've covered quite a bit of new york at this point or at least a part of it one however here is all i need you're much closer now a smell permeates the air as a thin blood especially as yourself occasionally you still breathe or remind yourself what life was like and as the air kind of gets thicker and warmer and sean takes a small breath he can smell something that almost sickeningly sweet what she looks up to you but she continues to walk but she gives you um kind of curious look is there like a like a sweet factory around here? She what giggles. Is that? She giggles very gently. And she actually places her, she grabs your wrist and she places her, your hand ag- across her chest where her heart might want to be. And she then places her hand on yours. And then she continues to walk. Is, is it? Continue to grow closer and the smell gets stronger. Sean, you actually hear in the distance a very minor groan. When the groan echoes slightly, she actually picks up her pace a bit and moves forward, giggling under her breath. Um, who was that? She looks back to you and gives you the gesture of, come on. Oh, for fuck's sake. Yes. Sean, picking up his pace to match hers, and you run forward. Eventually, another figure does come into view. You are not alone here, leaning up against the nearby wall, half across his side, his arm clenching a wound, perhaps. It's a familiar face to at least one of your coterie, but not you, Sean. You wouldn't recognize Johan. There he stands, or should I say sits, clutching his side, leaning up against the wall, mumbling to himself, seemingly breathing heavy which is bizarre, as he is kindred. But as you get closer, that's not what disturbs you. It wasn't breathing. It was a rhythmic beating, a throbbing. Behind him, his clothes all torn, you see what looks like a pool of something. And the closer you get, as she runs over and kneels next to him, the color is red, and fleshy, that pale skin color. It looks to be growing on the concrete wall like mold, clung around its red edges. And as Sean's eyes trail and follow it, it disappears behind Johan. Does not come out the other side. And she runs over to him and grabs him by his jaw, lifts his head as he very lazily looks up. She peers his eyes open before looking over to you. As Sean looks all of this over and we see many a different emotion crawl across his face. Yeah, it's probably a combination of disgust, fear, um, confusion. uh, As as these emotions are circulating across, she reaches into a nearby bag that was uh, next to him, a plastic shopping bag, and she dumps it all on the ground and kicks over a notebook, a little bit of blood in a bag, and a few other things. I I pick up the notebook. I'm going to leave the blood in the bag down there for the moment. Uh, Is there anything written on it? As you flip through the notebook, it does just seem to be notes, notes on blood sorcery and vitae. But as you get further back, Towards the, the more blank pages, there is a quick sketch of what looks to be the ritual ceremony from the crime scene. Wait, uh, is this Max's? No. I mean, I, I know you did it. 
is that what I'm supposed to be seeing here? She stands straight up from the crouched position and leaps over his legs and runs over to you and places her hand on your chest again and then puts her finger to her mouth and shakes her head no. I... I don't... Still seemingly confused, she rips the notebook from your hand, rips out the page with the ritual, and tears it to shreds over and over and over again, and scatters it to the wind, and then brings her finger to her lips again. You didn't... You don't want to do that. Have you stopped doing that? She looks down, disappointed, spins slowly, and walks back over to Johan, who's on the ground. She crouches looks to you. She gestures for you to come over. Yeah, Sean um, steps over what was in the bag and then uh, goes over to her. She brings you her. close, very next, or like right up next to her shoulder as you're both, both crouched. And she brings your attention to Johan's face. He's in and out. He doesn't seem cognizant of what's even happening right now. And she reaches over, and she bops him on the nose. It reminds you of when she did that to you. But as she does so, and her finger comes back, you see a long, stringy, fleshy piece of his nose attached to her fingertip. It droops and disconnects. And you watch as he himself begins to droop. Pieces of his skin become wax-like and drag and sag. You can see into his eye sockets as the whites of his eyes are more and more shown. His skin seems to slop forward and slosh like a slurry of a sort. And it lasts for a few seconds before there's a deafening snap. And all of that slosh returns to the face. But instead, you see the face of Prince Panhart. The f Why did you do that to him? You, look, I've, I've been looking into this and it's, it's pretty fucked up. You're gonna, you're gonna get lost and fucking killed. She uh, looks to you, immediately her gaze goes from the face of this person to you and she pouts and says no. And by says, I mean, she shakes her head. Yeah, no. shakes her head. Why did you bring me here? I don't. She sighs again, stands. She gives you the motion of quiet. And then, without really saying a word, she looks over to what looks to be Prince Panhard. She draws a golden dagger from the back of her belt, and she jams it into her throat as deep as she possibly can. Thick Vitae begins to pour forth from the wound as she slashes to one side and rips to the other, opening the wound wide. As Vite continues to pour forth and there's a gurgling, choking noise as perhaps this particular kindred is desperate to say something, she lets her fingers seep into the neck. She grabs hold of the flesh underneath and then with a tug, she slowly rips the rest of the flesh from the bone, decapitating the kindred before you, before it dissolves into ash and it's blown to the distance. She looks to you and takes the bag of blood and rips it open dashing it to the ground and smearing it, making sure none is able to be scraped up. And the notebook is picked up before she rips every single page out and begins to tear them up as well. She, after all of this, and Sean looks dumbfounded, she walks over to you, places a hand on your shoulder very firmly. Her eyes look to you pleadingly. And she puts herself on her tippy toes and kisses your cheek. She places her hand on your heart in your hand on hers. And she turns and leaves you there. Back at the club, as everybody's gathered together, one of Sean's junkie friends comes traipsing through the main hall into the kitchen and is shouting, Vera! Ms. Vera! You can't be mad at me, I'm here on business. Vera! Vera! Vera, Duke, and Max all hear this, of course. I'm... 
exactly where I usually am. I'm probably sitting in a chair, I'm smoking a cigar, I'm drinking some vodka. But tonight is Halloween and Elysium. It is. Which means I look impeccable, but tonight I don't have to wear a hat. That's true. Or a veil. And I don't move as he comes cheerleading through the empty hall. Uh, Max enters the room. Uh, he's wearing, like, his beat-up leather trench coat and his typical garb. Though he is wearing uh, a bright orange t-shirt that says, This is my Halloween costume. Do you cut him off before he goes look <laughs> to Vera himself? Sir, sir. Or does Max just go into Vera's room? Is that what you're saying? I'm sorry. Oh, uh, yeah, Ma Max is, uh, if they're all gathering together, he's, yeah. he's, since last we saw him, he's come back from the destroyed remains of his old haven. Uh, anyone who saw him come in might have seen that he was carrying some what looks like melted VCR cassettes, like uh, like old VHS, VHS <laughs> cassettes. Uh, and uh, yeah, so now he's so he's produced this T-shirt from somewhere and he's wearing it. <laughs> and as as Max, Max makes his way in, this guy comes cheerleading into the room and he's like, Vera, there you are, Miss Vera. I, Sean, just has a message for you. Oh. He was, what the hell did he say? I left my phone upstairs. Oh, uh, question. Uh, do these, these guys have never laid eyes on Max, I wouldn't think, so I'd probably be obfuscated, wouldn't I? Oh, yeah, I imagine you're invisible yeah. here when yeah. he comes marching, because he, like, announced himself mm -hmm. that he was on the way. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think he, I think. Come on. Don't hurt yourself. I think <sighs> he said he was following. No, he went somewhere. Shit, I don't remember. Sorry. All right, have a good night. And he turns to wait, leave. Wait, wait. I stand. I look great tonight. And she knows it. Perfection is a state of mind, Tavira. And she kind of walks over in his direction and she says wait try again for me this message from Sean alright just for you though okay Sean what did you say I remember that I was confused he sent me something and it was like what why would you want me to do that and I was, he didn't really say he didn't really respond and I kept sending him a message it's like hey do you really want me to go okay I don't he was going to get he was going to get stitches I think he might have gotten hurt or something. Fuck. Oh, did he get Stop, hurt? Stop, and I get a little closer. And I reach out like I could just could just grab his little throat. You could. <laughs> he what, is. A, what about stitches? He was getting them. I think he said he was getting stitches. But I thought it was weird. I don't, uh, but I don't remember why or where or what hospital. <laughs> I can get I'm, my phone. <laughs> I'm going to give you exactly one minute 60 seconds to go upstairs and get your phone and come back if you don't i'll make it my personal mission tonight to hunt you down and tonight is a special night so please do not burden me with this and your he time just... begins now and he leaves <laughs> it will be more than a minute <laughs> Of course it will be, as long as he returns. Maybe yeah. at a minute I'm like, Max, we may have to find him. Uh, all right. Uh, we got a busy night ahead of us. Uh, look. It doesn't take much. Max goes up there as he flings the door open. Um, he's just throwing clothes around. And he's just like, what the fuck's my phone? Where's my phone? And he's just looking for his phone. And he spends time looking for his phone. But eventually... If Ma unless Max interrupts beforehand. Yeah, uh, basically, I'll look around. Yeah. Do I see the phone? Give me your wits awareness. You have a much better chance of finding it than him. I love being Sean's playthings. Jesus fucking Christ. You walk in, and as you, as you open the door and see him at the corner of the room kind of throwing shirts around, as you turn to the table literally by the door, the phone is just sitting there face up. Uh, I pick it, blinking. I pick it up, showing the time. I look, I, I just pick it up, and I just sort of like gently, not so it won't hurt the phone, like lob it at his head, so it just sort of like bounces off his head. Yeah, you don't come out of invisibility from that. He gets thwacked. You hear that definitive that like plastic thwack against the skull, and he kind of lurches forward, puts the both hands in the back of his head. Ah, oh, fuck! Ah, oh, he turns around. 
Oh. Oh, shit. Then he reaches down. And you hear Vera in the distance, you hear. I found a Vera! I'm on my way! <laughs> I'm on my way! <coughs> I'm on my way! And he starts running out the door as fast as he can, Max. You kind of like step out of the way and he plods his way down the stairs. And he rushes into the back room and... <sighs> Sorry. <coughs> okay. And he goes, let me put in my password. Here's a different one. Hang on. And after the fifth try. I was about okay, to say, there we go. Okay. four, three. <laughs> yeah. She kind of begins counting down. Yeah. And you said, obviously, you were going to, you were following the stitches. But what did you say before? That was really any important information? I can't remember. Uh, I think I just told them to go to the club. Oh, yeah. Go to the club and wait for me there. Uh, me and, wait. Okay. And then so. tell oh, I was almost right. It was, he's, no, that doesn't make any sense. I think I'm right. I think he's high. He says, I'm following the stitches. As I was supposed to tell you. Thank you. You have fulfilled your grand mission. Now piss off. I am. All right, mama. And he just turns. And I'm sorry. Walks. What did you say? I said, all right, mama, relax. Do I not look relaxed? I asked you a question. You look fantastic. Thank you. Yeah, relax. Sure, I'm sure. If this is what you, you want to relax. I go so. up and grab his jaws. Just My fingernails you touch you want to relax, the, go the soft of his skin. Just breaching that soft part of where the eye is. My oh, fingernail God. is just that close. And I just hold his little face really tight. You talk too much. More importantly... You don't say anything worth saying. Next time, don't waste my time. Maybe I'll still have that hunt tonight. For fun. And I let his face go and I tap him on the forehead. He leaves. He grumbles after you let his jowls go and ugh, just walks out leaving the three of you in the back room. You still have a Halloween thing to plan, whether Sean's here or not. It's true. Sean's... with his strange little girlfriend. Or following her, at least, so his message says so. All right. Well, uh, I guess if he shows up with the top of his head cut off and his arms and legs missing, that we should have followed him. Otherwise, we have other fish to fry, uh... I think you're right that uh, having a Halloween bash here at the club might be a bad idea if we're going to be away. As you know, we have a bit of an anniversary coming up, and uh, my old friend Gustav has a bit of a flair for the theatrical. I think a 10-year anniversary might be a little too ripe a peach for him to resist, you know? Well, we can at least plan that we won't be here, so at least our safety in Elysium can be secured in some way. The club, on the other hand, well, we don't really have the security we used to. You know, half of me is wishing that prick does try something, just pops his head up, so I can finally get the lay of the land, know where he is. Well, you would know better than anyone, and if you're saying it's about time for a visit from Gustav, then we should definitely keep the doors closed. Yeah, well, maybe, maybe, it's, maybe it's about time that I did something about Gustav. How are you going to hunt him down? I don't know. Eh, who am I kidding? He could be anywhere, halfway around the world, or right next door. I wouldn't know. If there's one thing he's good at, it's hiding. Then there's not going to be much of a way that we can find him. We'll have to just let him out himself. Yeah. Yeah, maybe you're right. What if we set our own little trap just to see if he's been around? What kind? We won't be here at the club. Maybe we could leave a sign on the door that says private event. So it's not open to the public. And what do we got lying in wait for him? 
I imagine he cannot be picked up on camera. No, no more than I can. We need a pair of eyes. Mm. Yeah. Well, or somebody that knows the Nos Network. Yeah, the problem with a pair of eyes is uh, Gustav is in the habit of ripping those out of their sockets, you know? Oh, well. I do, in fact. Mm, look, uh, I'm going to hate myself for even suggesting this, but I couldn't help but notice Duke's been doing a little bit of uh, historical research in his free time. Yes, it seems he has provided quite a bit of evidence around the fact that Aster <clears throat> used insurance fraud and burned the theater. Uh, well, uh, I know it's not quite the same thing. Uh, Nos don't tend to leave a paper trail like that, but... Uh, <sighs> Do you think it's worse asking him to look in the goose stuff? I think it would. He might have strings that neither you or I can pull. Well, uh, I don't have his skills. Uh, he's a lot more of a bookworm than I am, and, uh... All I need is Gustav in front of me so I can get my hands around his neck and keep squeezing until my hands are fists. All right, well... Then let us figure out how to track him. It would be a good starting point, and I wonder. You may not be as connected with your clan, but I wonder. The little one, the stinky uh, one. Stinky? S yeah. Yes. I you... came poking around. Oh, yeah. Well, I might also have another connection. Uh, kid, uh... Side of his mouth kind of looks like an anglerfish. <laughs> You'd know him if you How saw charming. him. Yeah. I have a friend. Let's call him Terry for now. Uh, another connection in the Nos community. Yeah, I wouldn't say he owes me a boon or nothing, but uh, he seems to like money. Well, that I have. Hmm. Okay. So... And I think, if nothing else, the connection with Stinky also will allow us just some business opportunity. I feel bad that it was on such a sour evening, so maybe we could learn a little bit about who they are and where their business comes from while you speak to this Terry. Yeah. Yeah, I'll have a word. I'll uh, get a hold of them the same way I did last time. It's around this time that Sean returns, as ideas as to what to do about uh, potentially Gustav are mixing through the air. You can hear the door open and shut, and the footsteps that join as Sean eventually returns. Well, 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 look who's arriving with the top of his head still attached to his skull. Yeah, well, uh, luckier than some. Did you get stitches? Yeah, I, I, I got stitches. How did it go? Any um, smooches? Not this time. I think I pissed her off. Well, did you happen to take her to your friend's house? That'll do it. Every time. Um, no, this, this was less of a date. Um, I'm... I'm not sure I'm supposed to tell anyone. Secrets, Sean. Didn't we have a conversation about this? The most dangerous are the ones you keep from your coterie. Yeah, it's not like I don't want to tell you, but I saw some shit, and how sure can we be that we're not, you know, being listened in on? This club is extremely secure. She goes, Sean, I dance silks naked from the ceiling. This is one of the most secure buildings in this entire area of New York. Only the eyes I want to see see it. <laughs> no. I don't joke. Oh. Um. 
What right, is it well, you need to say? <sighs> she didn't want me to tell anyone. Um, I, I, she's planning something with Prince Panhard. She's she's planning to kill Prince Panhard, and she wanted me to do some fucking blood magic. But I've seen what that shit does to people. So, uh, just, uh hands off. It's, it's where I was. Um, I think she wanted me to help. She wanted your help in killing the prince. No, well, I mean, maybe long term. But there was a, there was a dude down there, and he. A dude. Well, yeah. So, I I go and I describe how fucked up this guy was, and how like I could Duke see would recognize his... the description. I don't actually think Duke is there. I think Duke okay, is okay. probably elsewhere. But Max recently met Johan. Oh, and, right. oh, that's right. Max would absolutely recognize Johan. So, yep, that would be a that would be a description you recognize. Whoa, whoa, whoa! That uh, that guy sounds familiar. That sounds a lot like uh, that Tremere buddy of Duke's at the Chantry. The one we've been feeding information to. Yeah. Interesting. I wonder if he's getting too much information and she doesn't like it. Well, she knows about him. She knows about him anyway. That's true. She was a Tremere. And with the clan alignment, it seems only fitting that maybe there's a connection there. What did she want you to do? You said she ripped her notebook to pieces. Yeah. Well, I think she wanted me to learn how to do whatever it was. She, there was like a blood bag and stuff. She wanted me to learn how to do something. I wasn't, I wasn't going to be part of it. Oh, wait. Didn't Larson talk about a ritual? The ritual she used to bind her mouth? Yeah, he said all the notes had been burned, so he didn't know nothing about it. Right, they burned up after the ritual. Yeah. She and, and and she's the one that guided him through the ritual. That was the other piece of information. Right, right. She guided him through it. I think I better get this to Duke right away. I think uh, he better give his Tremere buddy the heads up. It's been late for that. Probably a good idea. I imagine we'll prob- we'll run into the majority of them in the next few days. Where is Duke in this particular point in time? Duke is probably sitting out in in uh, in one of the main lobbies, um, just contemplating. In fact, I think if, if the camera like angles and, and faces him, he's probably just sitting like fingers together, elbows on the table, and he's just kind of like in that plotting pose where he he's generally just trying to piece information together. And that's how you find him, Max. As you step into the rooms looking for him, there he is staring at a wall his fingers rhythmically tapping. Uh, listen, uh, Duke, we got a problem. Uh, he relays the information that, uh, that, uh, Sean has given him, and the fact that, uh, sorry, what was the Tremere's name again? Johan. Yo- that Johan, uh, was featured in this vision, and that, uh, describes the entire thing that, uh, that Sean described to him. So, uh, yeah, uh, little Miss Stitch Face, I think, is wise to your buddy Johan, so maybe he ought to be wise to that. I mean, he's your friend. Did Sean make it sound like a vision? I apologize. No, no, uh, Sean, Sean describes it as, like, literally there was a guy there who was killed, who looked like that. Oh, okay, so the, he explains that. Yeah, he's saying that Johan actually got and killed then, in front of him. Yeah, with, with your piece, he's like, no, li- sh- Johan's dead, mate. So, yeah, he, he, relay- oh. he relays that. <laughs> oh, okay, all right, so he relays that information, and it's like, I don't know, I, is this... Uh, like, actually, Max isn't quite clear. It's like, is that some kind of vision thing, or was this... Uh, is your buddy no longer with us? I'm not using metaphors here. Johan, whoever the fuck that is, is dead. 
I didn't get time to ask his name because his head got ripped off. You actually, behind you, Max, Sean is shouting as he followed you up to clarify. Okay, what he said. When is Elysium to be set? And how much longer do we have before Elysium commences? I've been thinking. I think we're being set up. And I think the Elysium is designed to out us. I think Larson is aware of what is happening. And that he happens to be working alongside Mia. And if I'm wrong, then I will humbly accept that I'm wrong. Okay, well if you're right, what's our plan? Go to the prince and spill our guts before he gets to get his story out? It certainly looks easier that the Primogen will have saved the prince twice. As opposed to looking guilty. Did you notice how he continued to talk? To me, that's a giveaway. He talked a lot. That's how I prevented myself from getting found for so long. And it's the first problem. You talk too much. There are too many details that have me questioning this. As I said, I'm happy to accept my failures. But I do believe that there is more on the table that he skirted before answering. He never said who reported the body. Additionally, he never reported this missing utensil, as he's declared. Well, again, we don't know for sure that it was a body. We knew the ghoul was missing, right? Was our first report just... I'm trying to think back now. Was our first report the ghoul is missing, go look for him? Or was the first report, there's a body, go take care of it? Everybody knew the ghoul had been missing for some time. Eventually, the prince stopped looking for the and then was... you got the report of the body after. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, Vera, what do you reckon? Well, I reckon that if we're being set up, there's little we can do about it within the next hour. But I do reckon that we can figure out a way to outsmart Larson, if that is really his plan. Honestly, if he just wants to be Prince, can't he say it so we can help seat him? Must he be so trite? I don't even necessarily know if he's trying to seat himself as much as he is attempting to garner favor and look good in front of a large audience. Maybe. But even if Larson comes to the table and what outs us, we cleaned up the mess without any notice. And more importantly, well, we have something that Larson doesn't. Sean. What? I believe there's something that Larson has that we do not. A boon. You have said that you had a debt to Larson. Yeah, I've got a debt to Larson. He fucking stopped me from whatever horrible thing the prince had planned for people who don't don't have real daddies, you know? Yeah, except you do have one, and it's him. Yeah, so... What better way to rope like you him. in than in a life but you bone? Lot... No. He said, if, if, I, if we do this, I'm clear. He promised me. You lot need to stop being so paranoid. Sean. Can we please just trust Larson? No. Once. No, I refuse to trust Larson. He has consistently lied and withheld information from us at every meeting. What reason do you have for buying and believing into him now? Because if we trust Larson and keep our mouths shut, then the prince might die. 
and Vera here has some upward mobility. Ho oh, ho ho, whoa, whoa, chaos is a ladder, is that what you're thinking? I'm just thinking... Does anyone here actually like the prince? She's gonna fucking die if we just don't do anything. So we just don't do anything. Correct. We're going to Elysium tonight. And if Larson has the balls to out us in front of everyone, then I'll do a little dance. Who knows, maybe I'll dance anyways. And Max just sort of looks around the room, and if uh, anyone's listening, I don't actually have any personal problems with the prince. Just want that stated for the record. Sean, if, Here's the thing. if you wanted to discuss Max. upward mobility, do you understand how valuable it would be for us to deliver the information of an attempted homicide on the prince, an assassination, enough that could seat an individual from nothing to primogen? Yeah, I heard about it happening before. Worked really well the first time. What do you think happens the next time? We will all die, Sean. Then let's keep our fucking mouths shut. No, if we keep our mouths shut, and it is reported, because I don't think the intentions are to immediately remove the prince. I think the intentions are to look good and garner favor. If it is to kill the prince, then say la vie. But in this case, it's worth considering what happens when the blood is on any of our hands, as it could be directed. Do you think our lives will be spared? I wouldn't spare my life. Not even for the implication. Then, in that case, can we... Can we just wait until we're sure? How about this, Sean? What would you give? For us to keep quiet about Larson. What is it worth? Because to us, it's worth a lot. I don't know. What do you want? I don't want anything. If he plays us, if we are put at risk because of Larson, you have to promise us now you'll take his head. Okay. Yeah, was that so hard? Come on. Well, I feel better. Hmm. And time is ticking. Elysium awaits. And so from here, the camera hard cuts to a museum. An art part of the museum. Perhaps where Vera got her initial idea to sell drugs with art as a cover. It is Prince Panhard's one of her favorite Elysiums. And here... We watch as the Coterie walks in. And here in Elysium, and for those who don't know, all violence and aggressions are outlawed. It is a place where all kindred may come and put down their squabbles and intermingle without fear of plotting or violence. Now, whether all of those laws hold true throughout an Elysium is unlikely. However, the one hard, fast rule that is never broken is physical violence as that is cause for immediate final death. Does anybody dress particularly special for this? We already know Vera, of course, is dressed rather nicely. Um, what about Sean? Does Sean wear anything special? Um, no disciplines are allowed in Elysium as well, by the way. Everybody, just so that's aware. Or weapons. Mm, nah, Sean, Sean's in his usual gap. He hey. has a particular contempt for, for the airy-fairy bullshit. Of course. This particular kind of vampire does. Duke, does he stay in his typical clothing? Yeah, Duke will stay yeah. in the typical garb. And Max, trench coat? Uh, tra he is wearing the This Is My Halloween Costume t-shirt. Oh, yeah. that's right. Of course. <laughs> that's amazing. So we watch as the Coterie breaches the doors and they begin to mingle. And as they make their way into Elysium, you can see all the Halloween decorations that are placed up. Chris Panhard, for as cold as she is. She does take joy in celebration of, of certain holidays. Perhaps they remind her of her mortal days, or perhaps 
It's just a way to keep others occupied. It matters not. And yes, Josh. I just realized if we're celebrating Halloween, he's going to get some plastic fangs and a Dracula cape. And that's <laughs> and that's what Sean wears into Elysium. Within Elysium, this is where you get FaceTime with any kindred you could hope as long as they're here. Elysium is not mandatory, but of course it's highly suggested all attend. Even those who are of Anarchs are welcome, or Autarchists. Anyone is welcome in Elysium gathering like this, as long as the laws are abided by. And you see Arturo mingling with others. You see the Sheriff, Kadir, walking about, keeping to himself. You see Prince, uh, the Primogen Larson, quite separated from the rest of everybody, in the back, talking to nobody and keeping to himself and watching the audience. And you can clearly see where Prince Panhard is, as she has the largest crowd following her around tending to her needs and having light conversation. Does this coterie, the Drac Pack, separate and scatter, or do they stick together? Well, Max has been given uh, the task of maybe seeking out Stinky. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I think that's what... You can go looking for that's her. That's what he'll do. Sure. He'll sort of, like, give a nod to Vera and then peel off... Uh... Peel away. Uh, Vera, uh, Sean, and Duke. I, I think I wait to see what Sean and Vera are doing immediately. Now, while Elysium is not mandatory, it's highly suggested. And anybody who's anybody is going to likely be here. Um, Anarchs are welcome as well. Autarchists are right. welcome as well. All of them is welcome as long as the rules are followed. It's supposed to be um, a time of peace and gathering. Is my sire here? Would you like to go look for him? Do I, uh, no, I'm not going to seek him. Because it's a lot of kindred all mingling. You're looking all at like a mingling. couple hundred all coming together, probably. And obviously the prince is busy. Is anyone speaking to the prince? Yep. Uh, so the prince is the one you can see the easiest. They have a crowd following her at all times. People tending to her needs, having conversation. You can see Arturo hovering around the prince as well, talking to the people that are kind of trailing behind. <laughs> and you see Kadir um, kind of just meandering around the entirety of Elysium. Brief words here and there with others, but not really engaging in any conversation. And then Larson is on the outskirts. He's, you can see him kind of standing by himself, not talking to anybody, just kind of watching things. Uh, Vera will then wait. Uh, Every, the only one who will we're disappear. Just, it's, we're mingling. That's this fine. is mingle hour. And you do. We'll get to business later. And yeah. you do. You mingle a great amount. At some point while you mingle and you kind of stay close to everybody, but uh, Vera, eventually Kadir comes by and he um, he's kind of talking to one another, but he pays you more heed. Him being a Toreador as well, but Kadir's also the sheriff. And as he's got the long, straight, jet black hair that runs down to his waist, he wears an unbuttoned suit with a loose red tie and uh, dressed black pants with a, a nice dress black shoes. His eyes are sunken in and rather shadowed, and he just kind of walks up to you. Miss Vera, good to see you. Kadir. I hope your evening's been well. It is just getting started, it seems. Well, then I hope it's a home run by the end of the night. He gives you a gentle smile. Me too. Everything good over at the club? Things are well. We are dealing with some internal issues, unfortunately, but I'm sorry so goes that. the way of owning such a business. Well, you did give up quite a bit. We all do eventually, dear. Ain't that the truth? Well, have yourself a good night. You too, dear. And he leaves and goes and has more small, more small talk with others, similar to the kind of small talk he had with Vera. But the camera catches Vera as Kadir leaves, her gaze darting down. A little bit of fluster, something we're not typically used to seeing, crawl across Vera. Now the question, while the audience and the listeners can certainly see and hear this, is it obvious enough for anyone to pick up on of the coterie? I think Duke took the opportunity for Kadir to be there, and he walked away. Sure. Leaving just Sean to be anywhere nearby. Sean's nearby because he was thinking about asking Kadir about the last time he saw him. So he's watching. Okay, so he would see if, if, if yeah, Vera is showing you, enough. You see Vera lose a little bit of face. There is... um. It's complicated uh, <laughs> between them, like written in the air. Um, 
I would think Sean would be very aware of that. Hmm. I'm Weird. taking this opportunity to uh, to move to the prince. Sure. There's a bit of a crowd around her as you make your way, and she's wearing rather plain garb, a business-style dress, her hair in a small bun at the very back, and she's not. Ex she doesn't wear a whole lot of makeup either. She's extraordinarily plain, extraordinarily plain looking on the front, but she is a Ventru, and she is a powerful one at that. Does she catch eyes with me at all? Occasionally, sure. She she glances about and she ensures she does her best to greet everybody she sees, even if it's just with a gentle nod. And she will, of course, see Duke and give a gentle nod. I want to lean down to her to sure. speak. You step forward and kind of not push people out of the way, but find an opening that you fit through. And as you step in and lean, what do you say? Prince, you look ravishing this evening. Thank you, Duke. How can I help you? I wanted to steal a moment of your time privately. I believe there is something of dire circumstance that we should speak of. It wouldn't be anything that would breach the rules of Elysium, would it? Not on my end. She turns back and whispers something to Arturo, who scurries up and he brings his glasses down and polishes them while he's listening and he nods and you see him gather the people who follow while Pinch Panhard stands still. As they all peel away, there's a bit of a space that she's given between you and her and the people around. But still, you're in the middle of a crowd. There's still people. She looks at you. Go ahead. I'm going to lean in slowly to yeah. speak and whisper. Prince Panhard, I believe that there will be an attempt on your life, potentially on this very evening. She uh, waits for you to kind of pull your face back. Her facial expression never changes. It is utterly stoic, and she looks straight forward. As we see Duke fully stand up, she doesn't lock eyes with him. She simply says, thank you, Duke. Have a good rest of Elysium. And she very plainly walks away. Engagements like that with the prince are not uncommon. She is not one for many words, unless absolutely necessary, or one who's giving a speech. So to take those, uh, to take the, her response as negative would be something Duke would not do. Not entirely. It's just in her nature. It's also the Venture way. Correct. And Duke will meander back toward Vera, or will he just go and mingle? Would Vera have seen him approach the prince? She was looking. It's not something, like, super secret. It's not also, like, a mega obvious either, but... Sure. Yeah, you could. <clears throat> Duke would probably walk back at this point, seeing that the issues with Kadir have, um, have at least come to a close, or at least remotely, likely would walk back. Vera, you would see him approach. You saw him speak to the prince. Well, how did it go? I simply expose to her that there may be an assassination attempt. Easy seed. Smart. As long as we come to the table first, we look less guilty. As that percolates a bit, and we think, the camera's going to blur away still. Max is not there, as Max has been looking for Stinky. However, Max, as you're looking for Stinky and peeling through the crowds, Behind you, in a loud, booming voice, you hear in a horrible German accent, because it's me, Maxwell! Oh my, I did not expect to see you here! And you hear heavy footsteps and the clapping of hands behind you. So uh, the camera is on Max's face, and we actually see his pupils just get very small. <laughs> and his hands at his side just ball into fists. Uh, without turning around, he just says, Oh, hey, Gustav. Oh, you recognize my voice. How very nice. Thank you, Maxwell. So, how you been keeping? Things have been good. Quiet. I found myself here in New York. Oh, yeah. You like to get through New York every ten years or so, huh? Has it been ten years? Of course. You used to hang out here on a regular basis my my time goes so quickly 
Yeah, yeah, it sure does. And here you are in Elysium. I am so proud of you, Maxwell. You've made such progress. So Max finally does turn around to face Gustav. Mm. Uh, and it's the first time the camera goes with you as this conversation has just been with you staring kind of blankly. And now the audience can see where Max gets his monstrous looks from. Almost, not exactly, but the similar features of the bat-like ears and such clearly passed from sire to child. It is good to see that face again, Maxwell. I gotta admit, I was hoping the next time I saw yours, I'd be putting my thumbs in through your eye sockets and out the back of your skull. Oh, it's is so violent and so unnecessary. Yeah. Let things be bygones be bygones, Maxwell. It's fine. Oh, I've been having all kinds of violent fantasies over the last ten years, Gustav. I would love to hear what these ten years have done to you, Maxwell. <laughs> well, you know, I got all kinds of irons in the fire. I'm a movie executive now. Won the lottery. Wow. Yeah. I am impressed. I'm the toast of Broadway. How's about you? Oh, my life has been so busy, Maxwell. Uh, I almost forgot. Hang on, let me teach you. I need to... Ah, silly me. And he turns around and he waves. And as he waves through the crowd, a rather plain-looking girl makes her way out. Stands by his side, looks up and gives her a gentle smile, and looks over to Max. Oh, Max, it's good to see you. Hey. It's Stinky. Hey, you Stinky. How you doing? Oh, I'm good. Maxwell, uh, um, he's been looking for you, and, uh, I had, uh, well, I, we had heard that you may be at the club, and so I came to look, and you came up to me. I didn't even have to look that hard. Yeah. Say, uh, Disciplines aren't allowed here, are they? He says, noting her sort of plain demeanor. Of course, of course, absolutely. And she swallows very heavily. She, with a moment, her eyes gaze down. And you watch as the facade dissipates. And in its stead, a meek girl, skinny, whose skin has this weird mucus-like ooze over it, but still has long bat-like ears and purplish skin. There you go. She doesn't look up to you or at, at or at Gustav. He sort of leans in and just whispers in her ear, I got no problem with you, kid. She turns at that after you kind of say that, and she just walks off. Why'd you have to make her do that, Maxwell? She does not like her appearance. I do not blame her. Yeah. Not everybody can embrace the ugly like my old son. <sighs> and he, he grins widely. So... You got yourself a new child, I see. Yes, and I have been accepted into New York, properly by the prince. Well, that's great to hear. I guess we'll be bumping into each other more often then, huh? One can only hope, Maxwell. I do enjoy sequels. Hmm. And when the word spills from his lips, a distant, gentle rumble hits across the city. Everybody within Elysium seems to take note for a minute, and he looks around and then looks back to you. When done right, the sequels can be better than the original, Maxwell. And we cut to black, and we will return next week. Do Vera a little favor, would you? Break out that masquerade breach in your pocket and follow us on Facebook and Twitter at Pod by Night or Stitch of Fate. Make sure to leave us a little five-star rating and review, would you? And if you don't, well, I guess I'll just have to send Max after you. Special thank you to Kimberly and Sean Casey for sponsoring this podcast. Stitch of Fate wouldn't be possible without your incredible kindness and support. You sure know how to rouse our blood.